second speaker today uh, is uh, Fabienne Baratti, uh, CEO and co-founder of Emissive, a French immersive studio and agency that was behind projects like um, Mona Lisa PR and The Anime. Uh, Fabienne is also passionate about digital innovation and he and his team create interactive installations uh, that use virtual reality and augmented reality in entirely new ways. He collaborates with many museums and this is one of the reasons why he's uh, here today with us uh, and but also corporate clients uh, throughout the world to uh, enhance their mediation, communication and training uh, capabilities. Uh, Fabienne, it is a great honor to have you here today with us and the floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much Alexandra and thank you everyone uh, for the invitation to participate uh, in this event. So I'll try this uh, feature in Zoom. I hope everyone sees me. Um, so I am Fabian Baratti. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Emissive. Uh, Alexandra, you said it already. Uh, Emissive uh, is a company uh, that creates immersive experiences for cultural institutions and for brands since 2005. Uh, we are based in Paris and we work with uh, many different clients uh, such as uh, the Louvre, uh, Institut du Monde Arabe, but also brands like uh, Hermès, uh, Louis Vuitton, or, or uh, Rolex, for example. In this presentation, um, I will explain why I think immersive experiences can solve uh, some of the museum's challenges. And I also, I also uh, give some examples of projects we made. And uh, uh, I also present some the future format we are currently developing uh, to answer the museum's needs. But first, I'll try to define what I call an immersive experience. Immersion is uh, being fully visually and audibly immersed uh, in a different time or place uh, than we really are, of course. Uh, so it's a virtual world. Uh, this virtual world can be realistic or it can be abstract, it doesn't matter. What's important is that with the, an immersive experience, we really feel we are in a different world, in a different time or space. Sight and hearing are particularly important to feel immersed, of course, but also proprioception, and that's very important. Proprioception is our sense of figuring the position and the movements of our body. Uh, in other words, if we can move and interact naturally in a virtual world, we feel immersed in it. Of course, there are different uh, degrees of immersion depending on how efficiently uh, our senses are fooled by the experience. Two of the strengths of uh, an immersive experience, especially in, in, in the museum ecosystem, uh, are its capacity to give a, a context and to engage the visitor. A context uh, is setting the rules of uh, the virtual world we, we, we are in. Uh, by defining a time, uh, a place, uh, a life to a world, we understand the objects to, or, uh, or the characters that are part of it. So an immersive experience uh, can put us in a world where, uh, where we will see and comprehend the objects that are part of it because they are in context. And it goes further, uh, and understanding something is also uh, it also means creating an emotional link with it. So that, that's also very important. Um, an immersive experience is not necessarily digital, of course. Uh, visiting uh, the Versailles Castle is kind of an immersive experience because we see uh, the objects, uh, the furniture in their context. Uh, although it, it would be even better if we could see them used by the people of that time, of course. Um, some places uh, with uh, comedians, for example, uh, such as uh, the Betsy Ross House, uh, makes the virtual world even more concrete and uh, understandable. Whereas a museum gallery usually displays works of art out of uh, a visual and audio context. So don't, don't get me wrong, uh, it's neither good or bad. Uh, sometimes it's better to have a, a neutral environment to a pre and a work of art. But most of the time, it has not been really a choice by, by the museum. Because giving a context uh, is usually not cheap. And also, it's easy to end up with something a little awkward sometimes. 
engagement, uh, making people commit to something important or, uh, uh, sorry, committing, uh, making people to commit to something is very important for concentration and also memorization. It's also uh, generally a way to increase the level of, of satisfaction because when you commit to something, you feel responsible for your own action and decisions. So we want to engage the public as much as possible uh, before, during, and after the visit. Uh, deciding to go to a, a museum, to an exhibition is committing. Uh, choosing what I want to see in a big museum it is also committing, but, but that's basically all the engagement you get in most museums. An immersive experience will help a lot in engaging the public, especially interactive ones. Uh, because when you are interacting, you cease to be passive, you are part of the story. And that's what we are looking for here. There are different ways to engage visitors uh, through interaction. You have exploration, games, or social interactions. Good immersive experiences uh, that are capable of creating engagement with this kind of interactions uh, will drive more visitors to the museum. Uh, it will enhance the visit. Uh, it will um, also make it uh, easier to share knowledge for the museum. Uh, it will create good memories. And it will be also possible to engage visitors after the visit by sharing souvenirs, uh, for example, on social media. So engagement it's a, is, a, is a virtual circle. Let's now talk specifically about digital immersive experiences. Digital Im immersive experiences can be done in a number of ways uh, with uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, uh, or even uh, projection mapping. The goal is still the same as before, is to make the visitors feel they are in, an, in, another, in another time or place. Digital uh, also makes it easy to immerse the visitors thanks, of course, to the last technologies with the computers, peripherals, displays, and also because it's getting cheaper. Uh, there's, the, there's really no limit uh, to the world we can create in a dig digital experience. It also means that museums can easily build a context for, for what they want to show and for what they want to teach. So very quickly, um, let's see what the main differences are between immersive devices, at least the one we, we can uh, have access to. Uh, virtual reality first is usually, uh, I mean, virtual reality usually uses uh, headsets, virtual reality headsets, and it's it's considered the most immersive device because you are completely cut from the real world. Augmented reality and mixed reality, uh, they are blending uh, reality and virtual. So you see your your real environment uh, with a layer of virtual uh, of virtual information on, on top. And it, it can be achieved with different devices from a, a smartphone uh, to a mixed reality headset. Projection, uh, especially big ones, are another way to immerse visitors. Uh, there is the example of TeamLab or Atelier des Lumières, but uh, it lacks uh, 3D. You have also 360 videos uh, that also use uh, headsets, but they are less immersive than virtual reality because there is no interaction or proprioception. So the choice between those technologies depends on uh, the cost, the available space, uh, the desired stream of visitors, also the, the, the ease of installation and maintenance, and uh, how much we want to immerse and to engage the visitors. In digital immersive experiences, you also have different degrees of immersion. Uh, for example, visual immersion is stronger with stereoscopy. Uh, stereoscopy means that we see the content in 3D and uh, it's stronger also with a wide field of view. Uh, it's stronger when there is a higher resolution, when there is a higher frame rate. Uh, it's, it's better when uh, it, uh, it, fool, it fools your sense uh, in, in a natural way. So let's see now a first example of uh, an immersive experience. Mona Lisa Beyond the Glass uh, is a virtual reality project released uh, one year ago in the Louvre uh, as part of the Leonardo da Vinci exhibition. It's an eight minute experience, mono user, 
uh, seated in which uh, we discovered the, the most famous painting uh, in the world uh, in a totally new way uh, by meeting Mona Lisa as if she was really in front of us. And so we learn about her, who she is, why she's dressed like this, why she has uh, this pose and so on. And uh, everything is illustrated by Mona Lisa as a virtual person and uh, also with comparisons with other Da Vinci uh, paintings. So this was a, a fantastic collaboration with the Louvre and HTC Vive Arts. And we worked uh, very closely uh, with the curators to give life to Mona Lisa. It was not easy, I can assure you, because there was a lot of research and uh, interpretation to do, but it was very rewarding. Uh, thousands of visitors could try this experience during the exhibition and a lot more online because the experience is available for free on uh, virtual reality stores as well as uh, on uh, smartphone stores uh, with a 360 video. Uh, so of course a 360 video is less immersive than the, the real uh, virtual reality exp experience you can have at the Louvre or on the VR stores, but it's still a good way to reach people uh, worldwide. Another example uh, is a project called The Enemy. It's also a virtual reality production, but this one is multi-user and free roaming. Free roaming means that uh, visitors equipped with a virtual reality headset can walk in a big empty space wherever they want. In this experience, uh, visitors meet fighters from different conflicts in the world. Uh, these fighters tell the, the visitors about the, their lives and hopes. Uh, those are real people. We just clone them in 3D uh, because they uh, look directly at us, they wave at us. Uh, we really have the feeling they're here. There are three vir virtual rooms in the experience, one room for each conflict, and the visitors walk from room to room and from fighters to fighters uh, freely. This experience is 45 minutes long and uh, it's emotionally very strong. Uh, it was a, a co-production. Uh, it was imagined by uh, Karim Ben Khalifa and uh, co-produced by uh, Camera Lucida, France Television, uh, ONF, uh, Departement, and MEC. And since its release in uh, uh, 2017, uh, it was operated in different places, such as the Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris, the MIT Museum in Boston, uh, or uh, Centre Phi in Montreal. And to attend the enemy, uh, there is a dedicated ticket, ticketing. So do those uh, two immersive experiences can answer the needs of museums uh, and how? And exactly what are those needs? Uh, so first I will try to uh, assess um, the mission uh, of, the, of the museums. One of the most important mission is, along with preservation, is to give people access to culture and to spread it as largely and efficiently as possible. It sounds simple, but it's definitely not an easy task. Uh, what they choose to exhibit and how uh, is really a never ending process because it's directly uh, linked to the evolution of our society. And so museums have to adapt. But uh, adaptation requires font and innovation. The problem is that a lot of museums lack both. Uh, Revenue-wise, uh, many, uh, many were on precarious uh, uh, balance uh, before the crisis. Now it's a very real problem. Um, according to ICOM, between 6 and 30% of the museums worldwide will close and one third of the museums uh, expect to lose half of their income. Uh, innovation is also, uh, in my opinion, too often the poor relation of, uh, of museums. Uh, it's not ne necessarily innovation in new technology, it's in innovation in cultural mediation. Uh, and I, I see a, a lot of museums uh, entrenched in old fashioned museography. Uh, Although in all honesty, it's currently changing for the best. But changing is an investment and it's, a, it's also linked to revenue. So what the museums need are new ways to generate revenue and new ways to share their knowledge and collection. So here are, here are some things uh, that I think can answer at least part of this need. Uh, they are relevant for museums and also for cultural sites. And, and then we will see how immersive experiences can effectively match those ideas. 
<clears throat> first, museums can work on reaching more people uh, farther and wider. They can do that with a better uh, promotion. Uh, museums have uh, incredible assets that make up their collections. Uh, they, are act they have artifacts and work of art with uh, awesome stories. So there's no reason why, uh, why pop culture licenses should be more successful than uh, a century, century old painting. This is really a, a matter of storytelling. And museums, they are full of incredible stories. Um, the museum names, uh, they are also effective brands that are in most cases uh, unex unexploited. Museums, they can also reach more people through duplication and expansion. There are now ways uh, to reach people at the other side of the world very effi efficiently, like, uh, like creating an exhibition or letting pieces of art, but that's the old fashioned way. Uh, we are also seeing uh, expansion uh, like the Louvre or Centre Pompidou in, uh, in new uh, uh, buildings in Abu Dhabi or Shanghai. But of course, the most easiest way is uh, with uh, digitalization, uh, website, applications, digital installation. As an example, uh, there, there are a lot of museums now that are uh, providing free virtual tours for their, uh, of their collection with uh, 360 pictures of, or, or 360 videos. And this is also interest, an, an interesting way to show the collections that are uh, hidden in the mu museum's basements. Secondly, uh, innovation. Uh, society evolves, uh, people uh, are changing, and there are some ways to attract the public who, who's always seeking new experiences, especially the younger ones. Museum uh, should work on context and, on, and more largely on storytelling. Uh, they, they should use emotion and sensation. Uh, museum collections, uh, cultural sites, that they, they deserve to be lived uh, rather than explained. Uh, so they have to create an emotional link to create sensations. Uh, this is uh, the new way to reach the Stendhal syndrome. Uh, and this is a very effective way to share educational information as well. Sharing our experience uh, with others is also essential nowadays. Uh, being on site uh, with, uh, with our loved ones or uh, remotely uh, through social networks. So social really has to be developed in cultural institutions. As I said before, uh, it's important to invite the public to be active, not passive. Uh, and for that museum should create interactions that will lead to engagement. Another good solution to involve the public is to adapt the visit to every and each person by customizing a part of their uh, experience of their visit. Finally, uh, let's talk about, about income. Uh, revenue comes usually from very different places, uh, ticketing, uh, public or private funding, sponsoring uh, stores, uh, or even to, uh, or renting for, for, for events. Um, the museums, they are not equals in this matter. It depends on their size, depends on, on their objectives, or on their own ownership. It's very really different. Uh, but in any case, uh, new ways to generate revenue seem necessary. Um, Increasing the visit, uh, broadening the audience is the most obvious way to generate revenue uh, through ticketing. All the different points I described before should, should have an impact on attraction and the number of visits. The digital world creates also new solutions to earn money. Uh, applications sh should stay free, of course, but the virtual visit could be accessible with a fee. Uh, especially when there is a, an original content inside. Uh, Co-production of a digital installation, especially an immersive experience, is also a, a very interesting way to generate income. It can, it can be seen as a, a temporary exhibition with a dedicated ticketing and, uh, and something that can be deployed, deployed elsewhere uh, for a fee and uh, a part of the operation revenue. So those are a few ideas. And now uh, let's see how uh, the two examples I gave before match. Uh, Mona Lisa works very well in promoting and exporting the Louvre's brand and expertise uh, with uh, its offline and online versions, uh, especially during the crisis, uh, the lockdown. Uh, and it also uh, participated in the, su the success of the, of the Da Vinci exhibition 
uh, which, which set the record of 1.1 million visitors in the Louvre. Uh, this experience is also an effective way to, uh, of understanding the painting through uh, a, an original point of view. Uh, because when you're in front of Mona Lisa, uh, visitors are involved, uh, they listen, they watch, uh, and they, they even develop a, a certain affection for the works of art because they, they get to know it personally. It's not a social experience uh, and, and it's linear. So uh, the visitors in this case are passive um, and the Louvre's policy makes it totally free uh, to experiment. So this is not generating a new revenue, although it could. The enemy uh, is not uh, promoting or expanding a museum brand because it was not produced by a museum. Although uh, it adds to the innovative image of the venues where it was operated, such as the uh, MIT Museum or the Fee Center. Uh, the enemy uh, definitely shares knowledge through emotion, as uh, it is indeed very emotional. It's social, but to a certain extent, uh, because there is no really social interactions in this experience. It's very engaging. Uh, visitors have really to commit strongly uh, by uh, moving freely to meet the fighters. Uh, the scenario in the enemy adapts to the behavior of the visitor, so it's a personalized experience. And the enemy is a way to generate revenue, just like a temporary exhibition does with the dedicated ticketing. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, classic temporary exhibitions uh, grow more and more difficult to operate because uh, of the prices of transportation and uh, insurance. Uh, digital experiences can replace this income. Now I'll present you uh, a new kind of immersive experience that we are de deploying, uh, still using virtual reality, uh, that we can, that we think can answer even more of museums and cultural sites needs. Uh, for us, it's a whole new way to discover our cultural her heritage. So if you ever wanted to go back in time and, uh, and visit the Egyptian pyramids, uh, or walk in the streets of Pompeii, it's now possible. It's called immersive expeditions. So now I, uh, I will ask you to imagine uh, you are together with your friends uh, or family and you are all equipped with an immersive device. The next second, you will find yourselves in Egypt and for the next 45 minutes, you're going to explore uh, together the Khufu pyramid. You will learn about uh, uh, its history, its architecture, about uh, its purpose, and you'll be able to discover areas close to the public and even go back in time 4,500 years ago to attend the funerals of King Khufu. And you will do all of that uh, by walking freely inside a large space and in collaboration. Uh, in collaboration, that means that you see the members of your family and you can communicate with them the whole time. So with uh, this format with immersive expeditions, you get the sensation of a real visit, but you are able to do and learn much more than in reality. This experience uh, already uh, exists in Paris, it's a success. So we are now developing this format uh, worldwide. Our goal with the immersive ex uh, expedition, uh, you, you, you got it, it's to export, to uh, uh, highlight and preserve our uh, cultural heritage. It's also a way to offer a very original uh, and unique uh, educational experience uh, with, their love, with our loved ones uh, and with a lot of emotions and sensations. And for the cultural institutions, for the museums, it's a way to increase traffic, to attract the new public and to generate revenue. The main innovation uh, is, uh, you saw it, it's uh, being immersed together in a highly realistic virtual environment uh, where we are free to move. So I have to shrink a little bit. Um, uh, each immersive expedition uh, is also the result of uh, significant scientific research with experts in uh, history, in uh, architecture and cultural mediation. So it's very, it's uh, thorough, but it's also full of emotions and sensations. One of the big advantages of the technology uh, is that it allows a high stream of visitors and that's very important, especially uh, in the virtual reality context uh, where sometimes you can only, only have a few people at the same time. But with immersive expeditions, you can have, uh, for example, uh, 150,000 
visitors a year in a 300 square meter space. So it means also that it can generate important revenue. It's easy to deploy, to operate, uh, to maintain, and, of, and most important, of importantly, it's easy to use for the public. There is no button, there is nothing. You just choose your body as uh, in real life. So we just need an, em an empty space. And there is also a creative business model uh, that is based on the sharing of ticketing revenue. So uh, we don't ask the museums to invest uh, a lot uh, to be able to operate and to uh, get those revenue. Uh, so now we are partner with uh, we are partner partnering with the uh, cultural institutions uh, all over the world to deploy uh, this new format, the immersive expeditions and also to co-produce new immersive expeditions. Uh, because uh, for us, uh, we think uh, that the future really lies in uh, giving context to a collection and creating uh, an emotional link with it. And also because there is a, a strong need in social experience and innovation. Uh, just to conclude, uh, uh, I need just uh, 30 seconds. Uh, I'd, I'd like to tackle uh, a topic that's often taboo in the museum ecosystem, which is entertainment. Uh, this word uh, is somewhat, somewhat disregarded uh, by certain institutions, uh, whereas it's actually part of the museum's history. It's the, it's the, it's the past because uh, at the beginning, uh, museums were virtually the only places where people could see pictures. Uh, it's the present because uh, to learn about culture is actually entertaining uh, for a lot of people. Uh, going to a museum is a, a leisure in the vast ma majority of times. Entertainment is also the future because of everything I said before about immersive experiences and their role in the museum ecosystem. Uh, immersive experiences are highly entertaining. That, mean, that means they can drive a bigger audience uh, they can share knowledge efficiently and they can uh, generate new revenue. So that's it. If you want uh, more information, you can go on our website and uh, we'll, we also have a, a white paper about this specific topic. Uh, so don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you Thanks. so much, uh, Fabien. Uh, it was a, a really inspiring presentation and also like uh, it. Uh, give us a lot of insights about how immersive experiences might work. And uh, I want to encourage our uh, members of our audience to ask questions, but I see there is already one question uh, from our audience member. So let me just um, read it out loud for you. The question uh, from Karolina Wojtowicz is, what kind of VR gear are you using for, pro for the project? I saw uh, backpack computers with wired VR, why not using, for example, light wireless Oculus Quest or something cheaper for users? That's the question uh, from Carolina. Would you like to answer it? Yeah, so we are not bound to uh, a specific uh, hardware. We adapt to uh, the situation. Um, so, um, for example, in the immersive expedition, we use a backpack uh, because we, we need power. We need uh, uh, computing power. Uh, that's very important. Uh, we cannot choose yet um, um, uh, an, an Oculus Quest, for example, because uh, it's not powerful enough. In the future, it will be. In the future, we also aim to use uh, um, uh, cloud computing and 5G. Uh, so you have uh, big computers uh, doing all the, uh, their parts and uh, uh, streaming uh, the, uh, the I would say the video, but in, interact the interactions to the users directly. So uh, for Mona Lisa, it's a different kind of uh, headset, and uh, it, it really depends. Uh, it really depends on uh, on uh, on the, the the space. Sometimes we use a different technology because there is more lighting or less lighting. Uh, sometimes, uh, if we want to uh, uh, be seated or stay uh, uh, in the in the, in a very small area, we, we use a, um, a tethered uh, headset. Uh, and sometimes when we want to uh, be in multi-user and uh, uh, cover a very big area, we choose uh, uh, something different. So we really have to adapt 
and uh, and that's also good because uh, uh, like every year you have a, a lot of different uh, headsets that are uh, released that are being released. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and I hope it answers uh, the question. And I have a more general one, um, because when I was doing um, research uh, in Polish historical museums, uh, one of the results of my research was that the audiences were really like uh, striving for like immersive storytelling. And what was actually one of the main things they were talking about, I did interviews in for Polish historical museums, was that they want this experience of like traveling back in time and, and this emotional engagement that is related uh, with that. Um, so uh, I wonder, um, uh, do you have some feedback from your audiences from the immersive experiences that you could share with us? How actually visitors react to the uh, experiences you you provide them with. Uh, so it, it, the 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 yeah the reactions are different uh, also depending on the on the on the country. Uh, people some people are more emotional uh, than others uh, depending on the country. Uh, but uh, we saw, for example, in um, for the the enemy is really a good example because there are a lot of people that uh, at the end are crying. Um, and uh, but it was also the case for very different uh, projects. Uh, um, so because people are involved and uh, uh, they are part of the story, as I said before, um, they, they, they really uh, feel something stronger. And uh, uh, so it's, it's a better way to, to share a message and it's a better way to uh, um, use the um, empathy uh, in, uh, in, in in those experience and so people are touched uh, very very quickly and so the uh, their reaction are I mean they are good most of the time uh, very good uh, that's very important for us of course and um, and uh, and yeah it's uh, the 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 tra traveling through time is also something very strong uh, especially when you really feel you are there when you walk when you walk in the pyramid it you really walk inside it's it's something very very strong um and uh and yeah people get emotional yeah i can imagine that but i would, lo would love to also hear uh from you uh what do you think the immersive experiences uh give us that we don't have in like the let's say traditional or like screen-based digital experiences and how do you see the, the future development of such experiences in the context of museums, obviously? Um, so compared to a screen, uh, it's really, it's immersion, immersion uh, and interaction. I mean, you can have interaction with a screen, of course, but uh, it's different. Uh, my opinion, what was the, the, the most important is uh, to, to uh, the immersion is, is with you really to act naturally with your body. Uh, when you watch a screen, you 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 know that uh, you are watching a screen. It's it's flat, and uh, they mean it, you, you cannot uh, uh, be fooled by that. Uh, compared to virtual reality, for example, where where even if you know that it's not real, your senses they are completely fooled, and that's why you cannot really you know. Uh, Make a step in the, in the in the void uh, because it it's it's not natural uh, to do that or, or go through a wall in virtual reality. You don't do it because it's uh, it's unnatural. And um, and uh, yes, uh, uh, so immersion and interactions are very the the two main things. And uh, with virtual reality and also augmented reality uh, and mixed reality, which is a kind of augmented reality. And uh, yes, I, uh, I, I see them more and more in museums because uh, uh, again, uh, it's about context and uh, uh, context and engagement. It, that's so important. Uh, and I know that museums, they, all, they, they know it already and they are looking to implement it uh, as quickly as possible now, which is a very good thing. Um, so, so yes, uh, it's going to be to be uh, more and more in museums, and also because it's getting uh, cheaper to get uh, this uh, hardware. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. And actually, I would love to ask you so many more questions, but we don't have that much time. Luckily, we're going to talk again in our daily panel. Uh, so I hope that then I will have a chance to, uh, to ask you also more questions that uh, I have in my mind. But there is one um, more question from our audience member. So and uh, it's like a very brief question. So please, like also uh, 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 answer it very briefly. Is the expedition to the pyramid to the pyramid available online uh, ask uh, asks our audience member is that available online uh, it will be but uh, the, the, we focus really on a on location based because that, that's the only way you can uh, have uh, uh, the possibility to walk in a very very big space so that's very important Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Fabian. We uh, don't have uh, any more questions for the moment, but I hope some more questions will appear during our uh, daily panel. Uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being here with us uh, today uh, and for your inspiring presentation. 